Hello, everybody. This is Anthony and Beyond from Mission Star Podcast. Welcome to the show. Uh, so the cool thing about recently with a lot of things is that technology evolves and we are quick to adapt to whatever that may be. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about what happened this past week in gaming and specifically TwitchCon and what the announcements they made. But joining me to talk everything about all of these topics is going to be the other than Greg Dietz. Hello, hello. And we are going to talk about, um, basically, yeah, what, what, uh, what's been going on, essentially. So, I want to start off real quick. The first topic of the day is all of the TwitchCon announcements and the news that came out. So, this weekend, um, probably already watching some of it, but, uh, there is a, a thing called TwitchCon. Uh, it's happening right now. You can probably watch it on Twitch right now on Twitch. TV slash Twitch, Twitch.tv, TwitchCon, Bible Thump, um, and so on and so on. Uh, one of the big things that came out uh, that of this past weekend was the plethora of announcements. And let me get me pop that up real quick, actually. Um, let me do it here. So this is from blog.twitch.tv, and this is about the keynote. What exactly was announced? Let me go down the list. Uh, one, Twitch Prime. Uh, from the moment Twitch was acquired by Amazon, integrating Prime benefits specifically for Twitch was one of the most requested and talked about possibilities. And now we are happy to bring you Twitch Prime, the best deal for gamers ever. Simply put, Twitch Prime is a new premium version of Twitch that comes free with every Amazon Prime mem membership. It includes similar perks on to Turbo and the benefits of Amazon Prime, free game loops, a free Twitch channel subscription every 30 days, and uh, find out more... You get a you get with the Twitch Prime membership, which also includes uh, free games, a la PSN, Steam, not not Steam, but on PSN and um, games well, of gold. While you're explaining this, I'm gonna go meet real quick. My dad's calling me. I don't know for why. Hang on. Okay. All right. For sure. Uh, so, continuing on. Uh, the other big thing uh, is uh, Curse and Twitch have combined. Uh, Twitch or now that and this is uh, the announcement. Now that Curse has joined the Twitch family, it is time for the Curse app to become a bit more Twitchified. So starting now, you can customize the Curse color schemes to one of the most uh, many options, including our favorite uh, Twitch purple. And you can uh, link your Twitch ID to your Curse account. All global emotes will be available, uh, and subscriber emotes will also be available to channel subscribers. Transcodes. Uh, we heard you, we heard of you. Our goal is to provide trans codes for every uh, streamer on Twitch. We know streamers need these options to show their audience, and their audiences uh, need them to enjoy the, the, sh the streams. Starting Monday, we are extending the video quality options to even uh, to even more non-partner streamers, and we'll continue to increase capacity over the next few months. All told, we expect to increase trans code capacity by over 10 times our current capabilities, um, which means like you can now stream like. 1080p. Oh, thank you. Oh, speaking of happy interesting. Thanks for the host. Um, this this means that basically, like you can sh you can uh, stream at whatever resolution and uh, frames per second uh, Twitch stream you want. So say that you're watching this stream, but you want to watch this at a lower resolution, say like 340 at 60 frames per second, you can do that, or higher resolution, like you know 720 at 60, 60 frames per second. So. Which I find that pretty cool. Uh, loyalty badges. Uh, as a close-knit communities have grown around specific channels, many partners have been asking for ways to reward longer subscribers. Now we're able to announce that we just uh, a way to just do that. With loyalty badges, streamers can award special 10-year base badges for subs celebrate subscription milestones. Uh, loyalty badges are basically uh, badges you can put on your subscribers who have been there the longest. Um, just a little extra cool incentive for uh, for, for 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 viewers who uh, who have been around for a while. Um, then the last two, which I think is the most important, clips or sites to introduce two new ways to help your clip faster and easier than ever. Clips on mobile. You can now create, view, and share clips from both recorded videos and live streams right in the Twitch app. Clips on mobile is all is available on the latest version of Twitch app on both iOS and Android right now. Uh, clip trimming. With the new clip trimming tool, you can edit out extra time from start to end of a clip right when you create it. It's super easy. Clip trim will be available to everyone sometime in October. And last but not least, the one thing I think may 
spark a conversation of the Twitch TV slash YouTube debate, which may become more of a thing now, is the new feature in Britain Beta in its uploads. It's no secret that the vast majority of content on Twitch is streamed live, but it doesn't mean that videos don't play a big part in the community. We now we know that the streaming live can be challenging for some people, and even more dedicated streamer can stream all the time. As of today, any user can upload videos on Twitch to anyone to watch. Streamers may also download past streams and use the footage to create on-demand videos for their viewers to watch whenever they want. We got a dedicated blog post right here, and then put a link. So, uh, huge news in my opinion. I think that I think that. Uh, they are improving brand, improving the platform. I think the upload feature is a pretty big step in that general direction. Um, having to be able to upload onto Twitch now, um, and you know, videos of you know whatever you have uh, you made on Twitch or video visual content you want to put on Twitch rather than YouTube. Um, and I think the other big thing for me. Well, they haven't they kind of had those features like I know that if you make a clip. Not a clip, but like a, a highlight. You can put that just straight to YouTube. Yeah. Um, uh, like how how is it different now? Is it like the clips can go to YouTube, or is it like I'm a little confused by that. So basically, like whenever somebody streams, sometimes their stream is not always the most stable. Sometimes it disconnects or reconnects, or sometimes it goes down and like it's broken up to separate clips. And then you usually have to find some way to download it or go on towards the YouTube user YouTube editor to put it together. Now what you can essentially do is that if you're recording, like say this podcast right now on your computer and say something's happened with the stream, you can record you can upload that video onto Twitch now and then Okay, okay, yeah. gotcha, 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 gotcha. It's a it's a more of a like and it's more of a of a safer option to do in case Things might happen during a Twitch stream. Right. So, so like, let's say, um, uh, sorry, let's say that um, we are at Mega Manathon and we're right in the middle of like a musical performance and the stream goes down. Yeah. But Brian is like recording everything onto the computer, onto a you know a, a hard disk drive, and later he wants to put that entire thing up on Twitch and YouTube, he can do that. Mm-hmm. Or, yep. or even if he just wants to take the footage, edit it down, put, like, a banner in front of it or, like, a link on, you know, that, that people can click on or something to that effect, he can... That's... Okay, that's really mm-hmm. cool. I got it. Understood. Yep. The other thing that... Oops, I hit my mic. Uh, the other thing that uh, I should mention that happened this past week was you might have noticed um, the design of, of, of Twitch page itself has been redesigned. Um... Although it doesn't show up on Firefox, it shows up on Chrome, which is weird. Um, but basically, the design of, of the Twitch page has been redesigned to where the image is in the, in the very top, kind of like a WordPress type of, type of style. You scroll up and you can see the image in large. And then the um, the way that the design of like having the title of the game and the title of the stream at the bottom now of the, of the, of the stream box, um, as well as like the buttons on the top for videos when it's live and whatnot. So there, and there's been a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that a lot of stuff that has been uh, in the works from Twitch. The one other thing I will mention, which is right now being used right now as we speak, is auto host. Auto hosting is a new feature that Twitch did introduce this past week, where you can have a list of uh, casters or streams. I should say, well, I should say Twitch channel. I should say that um, of uh, Twitch channels you can auto host when you're offline. So if you go offline and you and you want to have say, you know, half empty energy tank be one of your hosts, or if you want to, you know, stack three, four, five Twitch streamers that you follow um, to be hosted when you're away or when you're not online, you can set up a list in your profile and then just hit go, and when you're offline, it will auto host uh, randomly or in that order, it depends on how you want to do it. So which I think is great. So, um, and there's a ton of other stuff they announced too. I think the one the other thing I will say is they also improved the host feature so that when, so when, uh, right now we're being hosted by half em- uh, empty energy tank right now. So those people who are watching on that stream, um, they can favorite the Twitch channel right from their Twitch channel, um, as well as uh, click on, you know, go to the channel above, um, 
uh, at the button very top of the chat. Uh, so really cool stuff they've been doing, really awesome things they've been improving with the Twitch brand uh, and the Twitch platform. The one thing I was really hoping for when they were making these announcements uh, was the fact for uh, playlists, video playlists, having videos play when you're offline um, on your Twitch channel. Um, that's the one thing I'm really excited for. I'm just waiting. Um, but yeah, that's big news from, from Twitch for the past week so far. Um, and we might get some new announcements. I don't know. That might surprise us if another one uh, after today. But yeah. Um, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's all Twitch news. Yeah, it's pretty rad. Yeah, definitely. And uh, as supporters of Twitch, you know, we thank you. All right. So I'm actually going to start off somewhere where... I'm going to go off to uh, the past. So, uh, I'm actually going to reverse, actually. So, today marks the 20 years of Nintendo 64. Um, this has been... It's been 20 years since the day since N64 has came out. Um, and actually, we bring up... Okay. So, there was a, an article written by Arctenica. The Nintendo 64 had launched 20 years ago and changed my life. This is by Sam Makovich uh, on ArtsTechnical.com. Arts uh, I'll read this short program real quick. Consoles like the Super Nintendo and even the Sony PlayStation were out of my reach when they first landed in 1991-95, respectively largely because of my youth and lack of free cash at both times. I'm sure I was the only kid who, who looked at wishfully, wistfully at consoles like those through departments, store windows, and on pages of Best Buy and Target, uh, uh, Target Sunday circulars. The Super Nintendo's here, they shouted. Code comfort, rainy kid, those parents made it very clear that they already had a Nintendo. Only one year after the PlayStation, uh, this Nintendo 64 launched in 1996 and became the first console I could afford to buy with my own cash. This week marks exactly 20 years since the system's launch in the United States, and it's a milestone I'll never forget. My initial encounter with the N64 isn't etched in my memory, just because it's conceded with the release of the one of the greatest 3D platforms of all time, or because it was first system to ship with four player modes as a default. For me, it marked the beginning of the rest of my life. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is, it's been 20 years since, you know, it, it's, it's been 20 years since like the Nintendo 64 came out, which is, which is crazy to think about. Um, but like, just to kind of share my thoughts on it, I think that looking back, <laughs> I think my parents made the right choice <laughs> because like back then I wanted an N64. I played Super Mario 64 at like at Target and I would go and play it over and over again because it looks so amazing at the time. You get to walk around in this 3D space um, and you're able to just do things you wouldn't normally be able to do in the previous console generation in that time. Um, and I was really, really excited, but my parents got me a PS1. Which I think is fine as well, as well. Um, but yeah, like the N64, I think definitely brought a lot to the table. I remember one time I sat down the entire sitting at my mom's friend's place, and I played through the entire StarCraft 64 in one sitting. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I, I, it's cool. It's cool that it's 20, and I think that it's definitely worth remembering and, and the achievements that I brought with it. Um, I'm not, so I'm kind of curious, if, Greg, if you have any thoughts on. The N64's birthday for today. Uh, I mean, I didn't. So, I'm gonna get a little uh, long in the tooth here with the, with the story, but whatever. Um, I didn't have I didn't have an N64 growing up. Um, when we had lost our P or uh, Super Nintendo because of um, uh, angry little brother. Uh, no joke, I beat him in Street Fighter, and he hammer fisted the system. <laughs> Uh, I wish I was kidding. It's, it's that fortunate. But um, I really wanted it in 64. I was like, that's the next Nintendo. Fuck Sony. Like, Sega's already out of my mind. Just like, boom. I wanted it in 64. And uh, uh, unfortunately, at that time in our lives, my folks, my mom wasn't working because of carpal tunnel surgery. And my dad, um, he was like working two jobs that still didn't pay everything. So when Christmas had come around, which we were excited, he got us a refurbished PlayStation. Because in my dad's mind, as most dads in the 90s, it, they were just toys. Who the fuck cares? Um, being super disappointed by that, I 
played the PlayStation because it was all I had and I wanted to play video games. Slowly, you know, grew to love the PlayStation and uh, oh, I apologize. Oh, uh, oh, um, but I did have friends who had N64s, and I remember, I remember playing uh, Super Mario uh, uh, 64, and being completely blown away by it and adoring it at the time. And but the, that that was about it. There was a few games that I remember playing, like uh, Killer Instinct. I remember, I remember oh, playing yeah. that at birthday parties. Mm-hmm. I remember going to a friend's house and playing San Francisco Rush. Um, God, but that, that was about it. I mean, I, I mean, of course, there was GoldenEye. If a friend had GoldenEye and four controllers, that's all we oh, played. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, and uh, uh, the other one that I remember being that I I remember playing a lot is No Mercy. Ah uh, yes, the, the yes. Movie. Yes, but that was that was seriously about it. And as I got older, I found more people, more and more people who did have those, did have the '64, and played it a lot. Um, and they would tell me about all these great games on the system. And I went, "Yeah, I I, I, I always wanted to play them. Like I never had a chance to play the Banjo Kazooie series. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I never had a chance to play, uh, like." Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask. Still haven't played Majora's Mask. Uh, I never had a chance to play a lot of these really, really classic N64 games until I was an adult. And by that time, unfortunately, the system hadn't aged well. And yeah, I, I still, yeah. I still firmly believe that the PlayStation and the N64, they're, 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 they're not, they don't age well. Those systems do not age. They just, they're too too rough around the edges to mm-hmm. be good games today. There's a few that stand out. There's a few that work. Banjo yeah. Kazooie, the Mario 64. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of them just don't work. They just don't. They, they, they don't. And um, I love that the N64 still gets loved today by a certain group. Now, I think that my, my age group, by the time the N64 came out, I was a teenager. How long? That's, you said 15 years? Uh, 20 years ago. So 20 years. 20 years so I, was I was, let's see, I'm 29. I was nine years old when yeah, that see, came out. See, I was I was 13. I had just hit that age where uh, I didn't want to play Nintendo anymore. I wanted to play something that was more adult. And I remember going, like, when we got a PS2. And it was all about horror games it was all about action games hmm. and uh it wasn't until a few years later that like i was like oh there's all these rad games on on the like on the on the on the uh, gamecube mm-hmm. and to me personally i feel that the gamecube is a much 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 better console than the uh 64 now people would argue of course it's you know the next yeah. generation yeah but the reason I argue that, the reason I say that, is if you look at, like, this the NES and the Super Nintendo, graphically-wise, Super Mario World looks better than Super Mario Bros. 3, just mm-hmm. because 8-bit versus 16-bit. Yeah, yeah. And you could make that same argument between Mario 64 and Sunshine, obviously. Mm-hmm. But what I mean is that the library of games were better. The controller design was better um and uh yeah i would agree i would agree yeah uh i look look i i can't stress this enough the love that the n64 gets is fantastic i think that a lot of kids a lot of kids growing up especially your age Mm -hmm. uh i'm i'm four years older than you and four years, like four years as adults, doesn't make does is a big difference. But four years as a kid, is a big difference. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, um, so by the t- like you said, you were nine, I was thirteen. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a pretty fucking sizable gap right there. Yeah, definitely, and definitely. I, you know, when you hit thirteen, when you're young, that's a big deal. You're growing up. Yeah. You need, you need to do more grown up things. Yeah. So the N64 just didn't, it wasn't in my wheelhouse. Mm, gotcha. So, you know, I didn't play a lot of the games on it for years. Like, 15th year anniversary, played a bunch of shit. But, but like, yeah. but what back, are, like, 
back in the day. And I have some interesting stories. Like rem- I remember some things that happened with the N64, like going to a friend's house. And mm-hmm. like when I was really young, when I was around 14, 15 years old, which, you know, at that time it was maybe 16, maybe a little older than that. Um, at that time, it was still the the only Nintendo console or the newest Nintendo console. And, uh, uh, you know, being a, being an impressionable teenager, I, of course, smoked pot. And so one of my funnier memories is that uh, we, my brother and his friend, um, let's just say Steve, uh, they wanted to go and smoke some pot. And so I went with them behind a subway. We smoked it, and in the presence of just being fucking stupid, I um, I grabbed a barbed wire fence. Why? I grabbed a wire. <laughs> Why? Because I was that high. <laughs> I was, I was, I was, like it was bad, and it, the barb, like with the barb, was so long that it just went through my palm. Man, wow. From like yeah, from and and luckily it was a thin piece of wire, so it just like punctured and went out. Mm-hmm. But my hand was bleeding. So we go home, I peroxide it and bandage it, and I was still so stoned that all I remember is sitting on the couch with a whole bucket of KFC, going to town on that, <laughs> watching my buddy play San Francisco Rush. <laughs> that's great. So, yeah, that's, uh, yeah it, it's shit like that that I remember, like little things like that. And then as an adult, like especially being a, a half-empty energy tank member, uh, with most of... Yeah. <laughs> uh, most of the people that like that are on that channel, they're all around your age group, like 29, 30 years old. And so they all that that was their primary console. Um, and, uh, you know, they'll sit there and tell me, oh, this game is great. And this game is great. And this game is great. And, and I'm just like, it's not, though. <laughs> it's not like as as a kid. As a kid, you kind of have this beautiful innocence about what's bad and what's not bad. Right, right. About what's, like, everything to an extent is good as a kid. And, and I say to an extent. Like, you do you do know that some things are not good. But Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, but as, as you get older, you're just kind of like, that's not good. And that's kind of how I feel about this sport. There's just a lot of not good. A lot of not good. Yeah, there's definitely games that do not hold up today that you kind of look back on. It's like, oh, man, that, that game was great when I was a kid. And then you try to play it now. It's like, oh, wow, I am totally wrong. I had different color eyes back then. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I do get that. Um, for me – also – Sorry. Sorry. I was – I didn't go, interrupt you. No, I no, no. I wanted to point out that it was a very experimental console for Nintendo too. Oh, yeah, definitely. definitely was. Like nobody has had like approach – like full on 3D in that way from any anybody, uh, with exception of, of like Sony. Um, well, no, Sony did in the PS1, so um, I don't know. I, I feel like I feel Sony. Like... Sony had some. Um, uh, Sony did have some. I think hush. That's because I need to be a little bit louder and have the mic closer to my mouth. Um, <laughs> Sony did have some, like with the PlayStation, did have some experimentation. But I think that when it came to software experimentation, they really tried to push that on the PS2. Um, and then console like experimentation was uh, never their foray. It never was important to them. They just wanted to make good software. Like at least from my perspective, the the user interface. Um, yeah, I don't know how to make myself louder other than just being loud. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> already right, good. Usually I'm on my Xbox, and I guess that works better. And right now I'm just on my laptop. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it in post. Okay. Uh, uh, where was I? Do, 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 do. PlayStation oh. 3D. Uh, yeah, they they always made like they always try to do new games or different games or get like developers to do interesting things with games. But Nintendo, they they really wanted to, to make their hardware stand out. Yeah. They always wanted to make their stuff kind of sit on a different pedestal on the shelf than the other consoles. Um, 
and that was very pre like that was very prevalent within 64 in the GameCube, and especially with the Wii and the Wii U. Um, and I feel like the N64 was probably Nintendo's biggest experimental phase. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I was I would say so. so yeah, like I mean, and that 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 also is like, hey, the controller. That controller, man. If we're talking about controllers and evolution, the N64 controller, like, no one has seen anything like that. And it was a, I wouldn't say it was a thing of beauty. It was a thing of experimentation. Because that thing is. Oh, that controller, that controller, that tr controller is terrible. Just yeah. Terrible. Like, like you literally had a, a, I think the first ever, like, joystick on a controller that was right in the middle. And then you had the button in the back, the Z button. And then you had the D-pad on the left, and then the four buttons on the right, which you can use for whatever the game wanted you to do. Um, it was very, very, experimenta very ex experimentational. And Good question. Do I sound any louder now? I mean, you sound fine on my end, but, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm asking the chat, do I sound any louder uh, now? Gotcha, gotcha. I'm trying to adjust, like, I'm looking at the microphone on Skype and where the green bar is and where the blue dot is. Mm -hmm. And I think if the blue dot touches the green line, then I should be louder. Only on, only on Twitch. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, trying to figure this out. Yeah. But uh, point being is that, oops, sorry. Uh, point being is that, um, is that the intensity for, for what it's worth did offer some, of the gameplay that we see today that was kind of started off on that platform um, and games that people will look fondly upon that started off on N64 and forevermore like um, I won't say changed the last game of gaming but like definitely uh, in a way I believe started the, the co-op the, the couch co-op or the couch uh, you know deathmatch games on a couch that you wouldn't normally do because most consoles at the time were just a two-player game um, unless you want to talk about the multi-tab that PS1 had <laughs> and like yeah. getting a bunch of controllers to work like that. But, um, yeah, like that was, you know, 20, 20 years old. So, uh, so next year we'll have, you know, 21. Um, <laughs> uh, so we get to drink with, uh, the season four. Yeah. That'd, that'd be awesome. I, I'm curious as to what age the, uh, GameCube's at. Um, very good question. To the internet. <laughs> Actually, if you can look that up, well, I go on to the next yeah, news yeah, story. Right That'd be great. Awesome. All right. So, um, the next news story of today. So, going from memories of the N64 to, let's see, let's go to, uh, let's go to this little thought-provoking article. Uh, so, uh, the PS Vita, a system that, for many people. You know, it was going to be a really great system, a really good good thing, um, but in the end, it did not prevail as much as Sony would like. Uh, this was posted by IGN.com. PS Vita, a great machine, but too too late, says former Sony executive. Uh, and this is from Jack Trenton. Uh, Jack Trenton, the former CEO of Sony Computer Entertainment, uh, recently spoke with IGN about his 19-year career at PlayStation and weighed in his thoughts on the struggles of the company's most recent handheld, the PS Vita. When asked about how he feels uh, about the Vita in hindsight uh, on this month's episode of IGN Unfiltered, Trenton said, now that, I've, now that I don't work there anymore, I think internally it was, this is a great machine. It's just too late. The world has shifted portable devices that aren't dedicated game machines. Um, and you can read the rest of it on his on his, on the IGN website regarding this article. B uh, point being that my my the reason I bring this story up is that when the PS Vita came out, like it was the graphics were great, like it was literally almost PS3 like graphics, and you can take this on the go and you can take it with you, and like you would think that a, a device like that would be you know will sell sell gangbusters. But it didn't. It, it did, at the time, it, the, the DS, the 3DS, which in comparison to graphic I, was. I honestly feel like a big factor into that, and this is just when I worked at Walmart. Um, and and I know the Vita wasn't out when I was working at Walmart. Right. We just had the PSP. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna kind of throw the PSP and the Vita in the same 
in the same uh, basket. Mm -hmm. We sold a lot more DSs than we did uh, PSPs. And I think a lot of that had to do with the same kind of marketing that, like, let's go back, since we just kind of talked about it, let's go back to the N64 versus the PlayStation 1. Mm -hmm. Um how was how was PlayStation's marketing versus the 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 N64? It was this is the this is the game that that big boys play. This yeah, is where you yeah. get your your big your big action packed high octane adult games. And the PSP kind of did the same thing, but when it came to why you would play a handheld, it always came down to that's a thing for kids. Adults play the consoles, the kids play the handhelds because. They have the time. They have like, oh, we're on a car trip. Pull out your, you know, pull out your handheld. Whereas, you know, like, I also saw almost no adults buy, and I say almost no because it was very, it was a very little number of adults that would come in and actually purchase a handheld for themselves. Um, I mean, they did, but not that often. And I went and talked to a friend who worked at Toys R Us, and he saw the exact same trend. Um, so I think that that had a lot to do with it as well. And with the Vita, like after the PSP wasn't like uber successful versus the, the DS, like it was successful in terms of like how much they sold and making money and all that jazz. Right. But right. Going up against the, the PS or the DS, uh, sorry, the 3DS, it just didn't have the chutzpah to, to beat them. And, um, and maybe Sony wasn't trying to beat them. They just wanted to put out a, a handheld. But that's kind of what I saw, and so the fact that like Sony was adamant about pushing the Vita as like the premier handheld console, I just never saw it working. Mm -hmm. Like I'm sure it's a great console. I sh I've seen plenty of people. Play oh it. yeah, it's got, definitely. It's got an ass ton of amazing games, but yeah, it's just when you go up against something that's a cheaper and b, um, you know, is kind of in the public eye as like a kid thing mm -hmm. it's hard to it's hard to sit there and say like yeah the, the people will win yeah I mean, you kind of have to look at it from that perspective i feel i think that i think the one thing for me that why the vita did not do as well as i think um is that the lineup of games they had and i'll go back to the psp even too it's like the lineup of games they had for those for those handhelds was not as great in my, in my in my opinion than the 3ds i think the 3ds had a much larger a much b bigger uh library of games that were great on 3ds you know get you know take it for its worth you know like whether they use the stylus on the bottom screen or wh whatnot you know which i think was you know completely useless um but at the same time there were i think more pl plentiful games and the marketing at the time you know it was still the you know nintendo don't you know, Sony, you know, can't do this and whatnot. And it's a usual PR type of thing. Um, and to go back on the PSP, the PSP handheld sold quite well, but only because people were able to find a way to hack it and import games that you can find online, emulators and whatnot. Oh, yeah. I've, I had like three friends who had, um, uh, they would get a, um, not an SD card. What, did they, what was it called? Their, uh, oh, their yeah, it's like some sort of like special PSP memory card that they would use. I forgot what it was called. I still have yeah. them actually. <laughs> they would have like yeah, they would install that and they would basically have like a ROM hack thing just on the and and the systems didn't really have a good counter towards that, so it was super easy to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you wanted to do that with the 3DS, you'd have to like you couldn't just buy the cartridge with all the games on them. No, you have to no. have a modded system as well. So you, you, you would have to buy like this modded chip. You would have to put in the cartridge sl uh, slot for I'm it wrong to about work. that. Please correct me. Cause I, I'm, I'm going off of like years old memory. Right. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Um, I think for me too, like I, I did held or I went held. I did hold a PSP Vita in my hand a few times and played it, uh, when my friends were, you know, off doing something. I was like in the game area, just checking it out. The one thing I felt that I think also kind of weighed in is that the when you play the PSP Vita or PSP, like it felt like a like a Lamborghini. Like you know, it felt like something that you could be a very cautiously aware. Like I cannot drop this at any given time. It's gonna break on me if I do. 
and have to pay another good amount of money for a new one. Whereas yeah. th- 3DS, Nintendo is known for their products being very durable. If you drop that thing, that's going to survive like tenfold uh, versus yeah. a PSP video or PSP. So like there was a, a factor of like, okay, if I take this 3DS and I accidentally drop, a, drop it at least like 10 times, it will still it will still work on me. And it's kind of been what Nintendo products have been known for for the most part. So well, I also I also think in that same in that same vein, um, I don't think that the Vita was necessarily poorly built because I remember having a friend who consistently dropped his and still worked. He even had a crack a screen a cracked screen and was still able to play it. Mm-hmm. Uh, not anything well, but he could still play it. <laughs> um, right, right, right. But I also remember, like, when it came out, like, there was a bunch of people that were like, it's a better console because you can put MP3s on it and you can put movies and shit with the memory stick and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, that's really fucking cool. And I really wanted one. I, of course, didn't have the money ever. Mm -hmm. But um, I just really, I really think that just, like, you know, this goes back to the old old adage of, like, why why do video games as a whole feel like a... uh, a boys club like why is it that girls are kind of ostracized out of playing games and that's because back when the market crash had happened or the video game crash happened um and there's going to be a full circle around this so just keep with me here guys all right um when the video game crash happened and then nintendo came in and was like we want to put a new system out there they didn't put it in the electronics section which is where you would find the ataris they put it in the toy section but at this exact time in, in in the United States primarily, toy stores toy stores started separating boys and girls toys aisles, two separate places. So they had to choose a place to put the NES, and that was in the boys aisle. Um, so unfortunately, for years, marketing was to boys. Uh, I mean, you go back and look at so many different ads, and ninety percent of them are geared towards boys and men. And I think that. To, to a point, the Vita kind of... Not Vita, but the PSP kind of had that same marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, at least what I remember of it anyway. Uh, and I lost my point. Son of a <laughs> bitch. Yeah, I mean... I, 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 point being, like... What Jack Trenton said... I think I think he's right. I think that the PSP Vita was... I think... It was a great system, you know, in his mind, like, yeah, it's a great system, and I think that it, it is, but I think what what hindered it, I think, for me, was just the games and its library that did, that it came out with, and it was not yeah. as not as many or not as, as good, at, you know, versus the 3DS library. Yeah, ultimately, ultimately, it comes down, it just comes down to that. It's, it's, um, like I said, from my personal experience, which I know is not, you know, it's not every retail store, it's not every sale of the, of the system. I just remember having like 10 PSPs or, or uh, <laughs> you know, I, there were yeah. PSPs at the time just in, in the case and we'd sell like one a month whereas the 3DS's it was like we'd sell five a day mm-hmm. and uh, we couldn't keep Wii's on the shelf um, and uh, I just I wish I wish to a point people had seen the potential of the PSP. Yes. I wish to Agreed. a point, like, Agreed. like I said, from my personal experience, having friends who had it, there were so many fucking dynamite games that came out on the, mm-hmm. PS, on the PSP. Yes. And there's a ton of great games that have come out on the Vita. And, um, uh, I think if, I think if, if Sony were to, today release a handheld console that was more affordable I think that's ultimately where this comes down to a handheld console that's more affordable I know a fuck ton of adults that have had have 3DS's I know a shit ton of adults that have 3DS's because we live in the age now of member berries Mm-hmm. Um, if you're watching South Park, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, right, right, right. And if Sony came out and they were like, "Remember the PSP? Remember all these cool games? Well, the new PS, the new P, uh, the new PlayStation Portable 
it's going to have all these classic games from the PS1 and PS2 era on it already. And it's only 250 bucks. Remember that? It's going to be great. That is, that is a very good point because, like, Sony was – their marketing in terms of, like, I mean, promoting the PSP and the PS, PS, PS Vita was not as prevalent as they were for, for the first-party games in their consoles. Like, yeah. it, was, it felt to me at the time like Sony was more like, you know, that the, those handhelds were like the redheaded stepchild. And they weren't giving them any love regarding, you know, what they they produce. They did, I, they did some, but like. Poor redheaded stepchild, man. Just yeah. So pretty much, yeah. And it, so, and then I feel like, speaking of it, just may happen with the PS uh, VR thing that that is coming out pretty soon. Because like, as far as marketing from that end, we have I not heard, we have heard nothing much about it. Other than well, the fact, I like, I think there's two reasons why we haven't had heard marketing from for about the uh, the PlayStation VR. Mm-hmm. They are kind of in the testing water still with it. <laughs> True. Um, they, you know, they their stock on it is hasn't gone really up or down, whereas the Vive has gone fucking way up, and Oculus went way the fuck down, primarily because of some shit somebody said. Um, but that's still the case. That's still very much real, and uh, I think if. Uh, Wow, where are these yawns coming from? The conversation is not boring. Uh, <laughs> we started uh, in the afternoon, and you're still tired. <laughs> I did a lot of shit today. Uh, I think if um, you know Sony, once Sony is more feels more confident about it being a solid product, and there's more developers kind of pushing content for it, mm-hmm. uh, they'll definitely like. We'll start seeing some more ads. But as of right now, it's kind of like. Um, it's kind of like when Microsoft released the Kinect. You didn't yeah. hear shit about it on TV or anything like that. They were just yeah. like, we did it. Here you go. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But uh, mm-hmm. but I honestly feel, I honestly fucking believe that if Sony starts selling PlayStation Slims, or PlayStation 4 Slims or whatever the fuck they're called, Pros? Yeah, the Pros. pros yeah. Uh, with the PSVR, like as a bundle – that's gonna that that's gonna really push the VR for the PlayStation. I really really feel that way. I think, Otherwise, I think it's gonna be okay. Like yeah. it'll sell okay. But mm-hmm. I th- I, th- I think there I th- I would I would I would ninety percent guarantee that there will be a bundle with the VR with PS4 Pro. I could ninety percent guarantee that. So yeah, I mean, I really do feel they're doing that because it's the no fucking brainer. But you know, we'll see we'll see on that because yeah. I've seen Sony do a lot of stuff in the re- in the past like few years that I'm just like, and what was your choice on that again? <laughs> Why? Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. We'll definitely we'll definitely see. I will say this before we move on to the next story. Sony is a company that does take a lot of risk with it, with, it, with games and companies and whatnot. So we've seen that from them. So if any company were able to you know take a gamble on it, it would be Sony. Yeah. Uh. So moving on to our next story. Uh. Talk about some Ubisoft. So, uh, I did we, we talked about this prior in the show, but Ubisoft has been kind of been facing with a um, has been facing a hostile talk, takeover from Vivendi Games, um, or Vivendi Universal, whatever they're called now. Basically, another another big company. Uh, recently, um, it was announced, and this is this, this is an article from GameSpot.com uh, by Eddie. Uh, any any Mikic, uh, Ubisoft buys back more shares amid takeover concerns. Ubisoft picks up 3.6 million shares previously held by a bank. Uh, with the possibility of a hostile takeover by Vivendi looming, Ubisoft recently announced that it's buying back a number of shares of the company from the B, uh, BP, BPI France Bank. Ubisoft is buying 3,625,178 Ubisoft shares held by the uh, BPI France which represents a 3.2% stake in the company overall. The publisher pay, uh, is paying $38 per share for a total amount of $137.9 million. The deal is expected to close by the start of November 2016 and is part of the company's share buyback program, it said. Uh, and you can read the rest of the article on their website at GameSpot.com. But basically, the reason I bring this up is recently, along with this news, they finally confirmed that uh, the uh, the head, head honcho Guillermo uh, 
is going to is going to retain his spot as chairman, uh, and Ubisoft is no longer in danger uh, of being hostile takeover. Um, and there was a fear that it was going to be, uh, and that many of the companies that Ubisoft works for or, or, or have, and the employees, there was a fear of like changing the landscape of how Ubisoft's games were going to be, how exactly they were going to be producing games, you know, coming out. Just a lot of changes that they were fearing. And with this, you know, the Guillermo and Ubisoft retain those the the way that they've been doing uh the company for so long ubisoft for guillermo and his brother like they held this company for a very very long time like they were the ones who created it so to have another company come in and take it over is you know it's bad news bad news bears so yeah um yeah well good job ubisoft fending off the vendi um yeah i i don't yeah, that's true until like yeah until you know vendi might buy more shares so for now, they, they've, they've fought off a Vendi for now. The battle has won, but the war may be still going on, for all we know. Um, and then, speaking back to the TwitchCon news. Um, so, remember when Amazon... <laughs> speaking of South Park. Remember when Amazon, like, bought uh, Twitch and they worked together and Twitch was going to be for YouTube... And that wasn't going to happen, and there was this whole fuss. Well, uh, Amazon announced this past week that uh, three new games that they're that they're working on. Because um, I because back then Amazon did announce that they were going to become not only are they a company that you know would sell stuff um, through their marketplace uh, and through their Amazon.com website, but like they were getting get into the game uh, space as well. Uh, and this past weekend they showed off uh, three new games. Let me bring up the names real quick. Uh, so one of them is called Breakaway, which is basically a MOBA basketball game. I think that's how I can, I can describe it. Uh, 4v4 players. So far, one map was, was, was shown off. Uh, they had, ex they had a, a showing of this uh, the other day. And it was pretty fun to watch, actually. Uh, the next game they announced was New World, which is a MMO set in the 17th century with supernatural themes. Players can build civilizations, fight through monsters, build wilderness, or other, fight other players. And the world adapts based on the time of day in the game, whether in in-game seasons. So, and then the last game they announced was called Crucible, which is a survival game based in an alien world. Players can choose and customize various heroes, form alliances, and betray others. The game will contain dynamic events based on Amazon's description of their uh, site. It sounds like it might be a game hosted by Twitch live streamers. In which viewers participate in the game while the streamer triggers events and watches the battles unfold, which I think that's freaking awesome. So, um, yeah, Amazon uh, finally showing off like, hey, we got games now because a while back they did buy Twitch and they, you know, are is are they also a game studio? Um, but this is finally their kind of debut of like these are the games we are working on as a company, um, which you know many people were kind of. Wondering about that, what type of games are going to be, and like, wasn't sure exactly how we're going to approach it, but they showed up some games. And from my, from watching uh, uh, the uh, the first game, Breaker Free, I think it was called. It it's it's actually it's actually pretty competent, pretty competent game. Uh, it, it will break the mold, become a, you know a grand hit. I don't think it will, but it does show like okay, Amazon is really taking some interest in the game industry and games with their studio. Whether that will be success, time will tell. But it does show that they're putting it with their mouth is finally. Right, right. So, um, oh, I forgot to change the thing. For yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll definitely see more in the future and we'll definitely see if anything more about, about this. I just, again, I do not like the fact that they pushing like one of the games they showed up like into the esports scene it's like dude <laughs> we, we, we like you don't you don't, you don't want to push your game that has not come out in it to an esports like scene when there's not even a scene that has been created yet so i don't know i mean i, I had my spiel about that prior in this podcast but yeah it just annoys me a little bit <laughs> um and then going from amazon getting to get some esports news because there's been some a lot of a lot of interesting things have been happening this past week. Like, 
like how you said that, some a lot of. <laughs> a lot of. A lot of. Um, oh man, this thing might be off-centered. Yes, it is. Hang on. Let me fix this. Uh, where's my thing? Off-centered. <gasps> oh, crap. All right, whatever. You're going to get off-centered footage, beetle footage. Anyways, uh, so this past week, the 76ers, the Philadelphia 76ers acquired esports team Dignitas and Apex. Uh, this is from ESPN.com in the esports section by uh, Darren Rubble. The Philadelphia 76ers will become the first North American professional uh, sports team to own an esports team. The team will announce Monday that it's acquired longtime franchise Dignitas and Upstart Apex, which offers a guaranteed spot in the highly covered League of Legends series and operate under the Dignitas name. Terms were not disclosed, but more established sports team brands have been offered in the marketplace at a valuation between $5 million and $15 million. WME IMG represented Think Toss in the transaction. The acquisitions come about a year after a presentation on the growth of esports, who was made at the NBA Board of Governors meeting. Uh, you can read the whole article on ESPN.com. Also, this past week, uh, the Wizards, Warriors, and Magic, uh, well, I should say, the Wizards, the owners of the Wizards and the Warriors, as well as other members within the NBA, uh, announced that they are also owning Team Liquid, another esports team which has a various amounts of teams uh, in uh, in various games, including CS:GO, Le League of Legends, and Street Fighter, and among others. Uh, "Quote: Team Liquid is one of the most successful global esports team franchises." Announced the sale of the controlling interest in their team to a diversified and accomplished ownership group led by two renowned professional sports team owners, media and technology entrepreneur Peter Gubert and Ted. Leonsis, Steve, uh, Steve, uh, Ar I'm going to, I'm going to butcher his name, Steve Archnet and Victor Guzness will continue their representatives roles as co-CEOs of Team Liquid and will also serve as directors for Team Liquid. Uh, Goober and Ted Linsis will serve as co-executive chairman of their new esports ownership group at Exomic and will join by a group of leading strategic partners in a building that is uh, bro, uh bo bo can I talk today? <laughs> their bro board based esports enterprise, and then it was recently announced today that, and this is a little weird, but DJ Steve Oki is now uh, now owns Overwatch and CS:GO esports team Rogue. Um, so that's a little weird, but like, hey, basically, all of this news, all of this news came in the past week, and. What surprised me the most about all of this is that I did not expect to see professional basketball teams of any nature or any sport will be owning an esports team this soon. I was expecting it to happen in another five years, maybe number seven years or ten years, I should say. But uh, this is happening right now, and this would what would lead into. I had this conversation with my dad the other day actually about it. Is that because we have teams that are associated with, you know, we got the Philadelphia 76ers, we got the Philadelphia Eagles, we have the Philadelphia uh, Flyers in hockey. This may lead into other cities might be doing the same thing. Like, it, the cross-promotion of what it could happen, we might have the Philadelphia Dignitas. We might have the, the San Francisco EG. Um... And I did not expect to see this happen to this soon, and it has in its past week. Literally, two made like two of the major players in this is Philadelphia 76ers, and then the co-owners of Washington Wizards and the Golden State Warriors owning um, Team Liquid. On top of you know DJ Oki, which is, I think is a little weird, but again, it shows that these athletes in the sports world or these entertainers are taking or look you know dipping their toes in esports. And seeing this evolve this quickly surprises me. And it's also reassuring about the future of esports. Well, it also, it, I think it surprises you primarily because it's not what you normally see in here. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, <clears throat> like, we've, we've kind of had this discussion when uh, Evo was going on and that, like, ESPN was showing it and... Um, it's it's such a mainstream thing now that like it's normal for this sort of thing mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I think it's 
I think it's definitely great. Like, I, 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 I love the idea that it's a thing. I love that, uh, um, uh, it, it, it's so mainstream now that teams have owners. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's nuts. Because as, 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 as I've pointed out before, other sports, other competitive games, they're taken a lot more seriously than esports. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the older generation just doesn't understand how it's a sport. Um, because sport doesn't mean athleticism. It's okay. true. Very true. Uh, on that same note, a lot of fucking esports guys do have a like a rigorous, a rigorous um, uh, exercise and uh, 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 eating habit or whatever because they want right. to make sure that their their brains aren't fucking mush. Oh yeah, but, definitely. Uh, um, they uh, a lot of the older guys have a hard time understanding how it's a thing and even why it's a thing. Um, so the fact that a lot, like I said, that Steve Aoi and and Seventy uh, Sixers and uh, it's just it's it's great to see this become a thing. It's so good that sports as a, as a whole, what we know as sports today, football, baseball, basketball, so on and so forth, uh -huh. they're simple. Simply, they're entertainment. No more, no less. The idea is to entertain us for a few hours. Then we go. Man, I really like that player. I want to buy his stuff. It's no different than going to fucking see Captain America and then going like, man, I really want to buy the action figure for that. Or, man, I really want to buy a poster for that. It's no fucking different. Right. It really, really, really isn't. Uh, so the fact that this is becoming more of a thing and kids are going to start putting posters of, of esports teams on their wall and... Um, these teams are going to get more sponsored and there's going to be training days and all this. It's just, it's great. I fucking love it. So. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'm, I'm just shocked. It is I, to see this, this quickly now than uh, I thought of like maybe they're like, you know, five years from now. Um, it's great. This is a, this is a very good thing. Um, and I'll, I'll end it on this. When you see commercials on TV of Buffalo Wild Wings saying, you know, we show sports of all kind, and they have a, sh a screen of Counter Strike on on uh, on one of the TVs, and they're like, "Doesn't matter what sport it is, we'll air it," and uh, promoting esports. That is very telling yeah. of the mainstream. So, uh, <laughs> I am super excited. And we're gonna wait and see how this goes, but um, it's happening. It's it's. I'm about to watch ESL right now, which is held at the New York uh, Garden, which is gonna be a, a Street Fighter Five match happening for Grand Finals, and that's yeah, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Anyways, <laughs> uh, that's a show for us. Actually, speaking of which, um, so before we go, Greg, where can I find you on the internet? You can find me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, under Chub Rock Geek, uh, just all one word at Chub Rock Geek. You can find me on uh, Snapchat at Chub Rock Snap. I occasionally have some dumb fucking things on there. Um, you can find my uh, my reviews and stuff on the YouTube page, with Anthony will talk about in a moment. And uh, you can find me every Saturday on Twitch.tv slash Half Empty Energy Tank. Uh, they're currently hosting. Uh, thank you for whoever's doing that, uh, unless that's an auto host thing. Um, regardless, you can follow me. You can follow them, and I stream every Saturday. But we also have an entire schedule every day of the week for four hours in the evening. If you're on the West Coast, like Anthony and I are, five to nine. If you're on the East Coast, it's eight to twelve. And if you're in the middle of the country, figure it out, because uh, I don't remember. But um, uh, Definitely come check us out. Um, we're ramping up towards uh, the big event of in January, which is the Mega Manathon and MAGFest. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be a big thing. Uh, I don't know if we have any events before that, so we'll, we'll see. But uh, but that's what we're ramping up towards. So awesome. Check us out. Awesome. 
Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Defect of Naruto. You can follow the work that me and Greg do on our website at MissionStartPodcast.com. You can also follow me on my own Twitch channel when you check me out. Uh, I'm on twitch.tv slash clawmaster4, which I air uh, Skullgirls, art, and uh, other games I want to play, single player game wise. Um, but, let me do one more thing. So, if you enjoy this podcast, if you enjoy the stuff we talked about today on this Twitch channel, um, also, you know, if you're watching this through uh, uh, Hutch's Twitch channel or have the MC Energy Tank, please hit that follow button on this on that uh, that the heart you can follow us on because we are live every Sunday at 3 p.m. Today is a little different, but 3 p.m. is our usual schedule, uh, 3 to 4 for your weekly news in the video game industry. Uh, you can also follow us on. I don't know what, uh, can I talk today? <laughs> you can follow us on iTunes and Stitcher for Mission Star Podcast for the audio version as well as on our website in the podcast se- podcast section. Um, if you enjoy convention talk, if you enjoy us talking about the conventions we have been to uh, recently, you know, going to Comic Con or going to you know Anime Expo or whatnot, check out the Conover, which is also on iTunes and Stitcher as well as in the podcast section of our website. And if you enjoy entertainment, movies, comic books, you know, specifically with with some new ones, including Luke Cage, talk about uh, this past weekend that came out. Check out the Rolling Twenties. Just finished it. Check it out. Yes, definitely. Uh, check out the Rolling Twenties also on iTunes, Stitcher, and on our website at missionsoftpodcast.com and Patreon. Or not Patreon. In our podcast section of the site. Uh, speaking of Patreon, we are also on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Mission Star Podcast, where you can support us. Check out all the goodies there. And, uh, yeah, you can support us that way. But anyways, after all the shameless promotion, it's gonna end this, we're going to end the show. So, thank you guys for coming by. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys who are watching on YouTube. We'll see you guys next time.